Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's going on guys? Welcome to Amigos Code. In this full Docker tutorial, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about Docker. This course is designed for beginners to take you through Docker and then fully grasp Docker. So this is everything that you will need in order to start using Docker. Docker is so popular and you must have it on your CV. In this course, I'm going to make sure that you understand what Docker is, the difference between Docker and virtual machines. Then we're going to move on into understanding what containers are, exposing ports, understand the useful commands that Docker has to run. Moving on, I'm going to show you how to take two applications, one website, as well as an API built with Express.js. And then we're going to write a Docker file to package it up so that we can run multiple containers. So this course will be so practical that you will learn a lot. In this course, I'm also going to teach you about the best practices when it comes to Docker, how to properly create your Docker files by using um, layering and caching effectively. I'm also going to teach you how to tag your applications, meaning that you can have multiple versions of your application and then allow you to choose between which one that you want to run. We're going to learn how to debug, i.e. how to bash into containers so we know what is going on, how to inspect logs and a bunch more. If you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe. Give me a thumbs up so I can keep on recording these videos. Also, if you're not part of the Amigos Code community, I would love to have you there because the community is growing. Without further ado, let's go ahead and learn about Docker. Right, one quick thing that I want to mention, and that is, please do practice as I teach. Like, I don't want you just to sit there and watch this course and do nothing because I want you to gain real value of this course. So as I type, go ahead and type and experiment. If you get errors or there is something that you're not quite understanding, just post them on the group or comment down below in this video and we will get back to you. So I really want to add value. So by the end of this course, you should have a complete understanding of what Docker is and you can have it on your CV. Also, if you want to take this course at your own pace and then receive a certificate, go ahead and enroll to the exact same course on my website. That way you get a certificate so that you can show to employers. This is all for now. Again, if you haven't joined the private Facebook group as well as Discord, go ahead and join now. And without further ado, let's kick off this course. All right, let's go ahead and understand what exactly is Docker. So Docker is a tool for running application in an isolated environment. So it's very similar to a virtual machine, but it's much faster and doesn't require a lot of memory and an entire operating system to operate. The cool thing about Docker is that your app runs in the exact same environment. If it works on my machine, it will definitely work on your machine. If it works on the staging environment, it will also work in the production environment. So this is one of the benefits of Docker. And pretty much it just works, right? If it works on my machine, then you are guaranteed that whatever you deploy your application, it will also work. And Docker nowadays is the standard for software deployment. Pretty much everyone is adopting Docker in their workflow for software deployment because it makes it easier for packaging applications. You don't have to deal with different OS, different um, distributions, and pretty much whatever you package will work in production. So pretty much almost every company is adopting Docker and you should be aware of how to use this tool as well. So what exactly is the difference between containers and virtual machines? So a container is an abstraction at the app layer that packages your code and dependencies together. Multiple containers can run on the same machine and share the OS kernel with other containers and each running as an isolated process in user space. So this is very important because 
a container doesn't require a full operating system and it simply shares the underlying operating system but running in isolation of other containers. In contrast with virtual machines is an abstraction of physical hardware turning one server into many servers. The hypervisor allows multiple VMs to run on a single machine. Each includes a full copy of an operating system. This is very important, a full copy of an operating system. Also the application, necessary binaries and libraries taking up tens of gigabytes. And also they are very slow to boot. So just let me show you exactly uh, a visual diagram. So this is a containerized application. So you can see that you have multiple apps Underneath, you have Docker and nothing else. So Docker manages all of the containers that you spin up. And underneath Docker, you have the host operating system, and then you have the actual infrastructure. In contrast with a virtual machine, you can see that you have the infrastructure. On top of that, you have the hypervisor, and this allows one server to be turned into multiple servers. And you can see that each virtual machine requires a full guest operating system. So this is the fundamental difference between Docker and virtual machines. So the benefits of using Docker is that you can run a container in seconds instead of minutes. As you see that for you to spin up a full operating system, it takes a while. Also, less resources results in less disk space, as well as less memory. So these are very good advantages of using Docker instead of virtual machine. And as I mentioned, you don't need a full operating system. So these are some of the advantages of using Docker, but obviously you have things such as deployment and testing. So you can test things locally and then you can take it to whatever environment and it is absolutely guaranteed to work. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on and learn how to install Docker. All right, let's go ahead and learn exactly how to download and install Docker. Navigate to docs.docker.com forward slash install. So right here, you can see that you can download Docker for Linux, Mac OS and Windows. So the process is the exact same thing, whether you are on Windows or Mac. So because I'm on a Mac, let me go ahead and show you exactly how to get it for Mac. But for Windows is the exact same thing. I'm going to show you in a second. So go ahead and click on Mac OS. And then you can see that to download Docker for Mac, head to docker.hub. So what I'm gonna do is press command and click on the link. And then right here, you can see that I can get started with Docker. So what I need to do first, so to download uh, Docker desktop, so this is what we need, is to pretty much create an account or sign in. And once you have the account, you will be able to install Docker. The process is very straightforward. So you can see the requirements. So Mac OS Sierra 10.12 or above. So if you are using a previous version, you need to download Docker Toolbox. So Docker Toolbox is the old way of using Docker and Docker Desktop is the newest and better way of working with Docker. So let me go ahead and pretty much show you exactly how it works or actually how it's downloaded. So you can see that they have a screenshot. So basically once you have an account, then you'll be able to download Docker. So basically you take this docker.app, put it into your applications, and then you'll see that you have Docker. And then at the very top on your toolbar, you can see that you'll get a Docker logo. So this logo right here, and you can see that it will say Docker is up and running. And you can see right here in my machine, because I already have Docker installed, you can see that Docker is up and running. So it's very straightforward to get started with Docker. So for Windows, it's pretty much the same thing. So what I'm going to do 
is collapse this, click on Windows, install Docker on Windows, and you can see that it's the exact same thing. So download from Docker Hub, there we go, it's the exact same thing. So please log in to download, and then once you have it downloaded, you can follow these instructions right here. But basically, it's the exact same thing here. So if I scroll down, you can see that you have Docker for Windows. You will also get the actual Docker logo. And then you'll see that Docker is now up and running, which is the exact same thing that I have here. So go ahead and download Docker Desktop for whatever operating system that you are using. And if you have any questions or if you get stuck, go ahead and drop me a message. But this should be very straightforward. In the meantime, Join me in the next one. Now that we have Docker installed, go ahead and click on this Docker logo icon at the very top. And you can see that we have a couple of options right here. So we have preferences, updates, uh, documentation, more of Docker, sign in and Kubernetes. So what I want you to do first is to open up your terminal or command line and simply type Docker. And you should see that you get a bunch of commands. So you can see that you get um, a bunch of stuff really. So options uh, and then management commands. And you can see all of these commands that we will learn in this course. So you saw that you can type Docker, but also if I go ahead and type Docker dash dash and then version, you can see that this is the version of Docker that I have installed on my machine. This might be a bit different for you, but the commands will be the exact same thing. So what I want you to bear in mind is that if I click on the Docker logo again and then quit Docker desktop and then type Docker, and for now, simply go ahead and type Docker PS. You can see that cannot connect to Docker daemon right here. So the Docker daemon is not running. So whenever you are using Docker, make sure that the actual Docker uh, daemon is running. So let me go ahead and simply run it again. And let me skip this version. And you can see that it's uh, starting, just give it a second. You can see that it's starting right here. And there we go. You can see that it's green. If I now go back to terminal and type Docker PS, you can see that this time it works, right? So just to bear in mind that whenever you want to use Docker, you have to make sure that the Docker daemon is running. And there we go. You now have successfully installed Docker and know how to get it up and running. Let's begin our journey in learning Docker. Let's begin our journey learning this awesome technology called Docker. All right, let's go ahead and learn about Docker images and containers. So an image is a template for creating an environment of your choice. This could be a database, a web application, an app that does some processing. Pretty much it could be anything. An image is also a snapshot and you'll learn more about this. Basically, you can create multiple snapshots i.e. versions of your image, and then you can point to whatever version that you want at a particular time. So let's say that you deploy to production an image, you find out an error, and what you can do is simply go back to the previous image. What is so special about an image is that it contains everything your app needs to run. It contains the operating system, any software required, as well as the application code. So once you have an image, then containers come into play. So a container is simply a running instance of an image. 
So what you do first is you have an image and then from that image, you simply run a container. Let's go ahead and download an existing image and run a container from it. All right, let's go ahead and pull an image and run a container from it. So navigate to hub.docker.com and right here you can see a list of all public images. So right here, so you can see that if I scroll down, you have a list of official images. So these are companies, for example, such as Nginx, Mongo, Node, Redis, Ubuntu, Couchbase, uh, Golang. So there are tons of these official images that we can use, but also there are some unofficial images. So these would be, for example, someone like yourself or I that don't necessarily own a large company, but we just build images for other developers to use. So we could also distribute these images inside of this Docker registry. So Docker Hub is simply a registry and we're going to learn more about registries later on but a registry is simply a place where you can download images so you can see that i can explore some images so let me go ahead and simply explore and you can see that there are tons of these images right so i can scroll down and the and the list is endless so the one that I want to try out with you is this one, Nginx. So what I'm going to do is, if you don't see this image right here, so Nginx, so scroll up, and right here, simply type Nginx. So Ng, I always get this wrong, so Nginx, Nginx, just like that. So I always get this uh, name wrong. So Nginx is simply a web server, um, a reverse proxy, a load balancer, and it's very popular and it's used all over the internet. So if I scroll down, you can see that they have some tags and we're gonna learn about tags later on, Docker file as well, later on we will learn about this and they have some quick reference. So what is Nginx and how to use this image? So let's actually scroll up and you can see that they have this command right here. So docker pull and then nginx. And let's go ahead and pull this image. So let me go ahead and open up terminal or you can use command line if you are on Windows. So let's simply go ahead and say docker and then pull and then ng and then x, just like that. And then press enter. And you can see that it's using a default tag and it's actually downloading Nginx for us. So just give it a second, and I'm gonna explain all of this later on, but basically, if this image changes, it doesn't have to download every single layer again, so it is cached. There we go, and you can see that it has downloaded a newer image for Nginx, and then column latest. So this part right here, is the actual tag and we're going to learn about tags later on but basically this is simply getting the latest image now in order for us to see a list of images that we have locally simply go ahead and type docker and then images and there we go so you can see that the image that we have currently is this one so we only have one image and the name is nginx the tag is latest. This is the image ID. And you can see that it was created about three days ago. And the size is 109 megabytes. There we go. You successfully managed to pull your very first Docker image. Next, let's go ahead and run a container from this image. All right, let's go ahead and run a container from this image that we've just downloaded. So Nginx, and then the tag is latest. So remember, a container is a running instance of an image. So to run a container from an image, simply type Docker and then run, and then we have to specify the actual image. So in our case will be Nginx, 
and then you have to specify the tag. So in our case, latest. So if I press enter, you can see that we get nothing. So believe me or not, but we are actually running a container. So the reason why this is hanging, because the process has started and is just waiting. So what I'm going to do is open up a new tab. And inside of this tab, what I'm going to do is first, let me actually make this bigger. And so something like that, so you can see exactly what we're doing. So what I'm going to do now is describe the list of all running containers. To do that, simply type Docker and then container and then LS. Press enter. You can see that we have this container with an ID of 83910ABD360C. And then the image is Nginx latest. You can see some commands created about a minute ago. The status is up about a minute. And you can see that the ports, it's 80. So 80, I'm gonna explain the port in a second. And the name is Happy Volhard. So I'm gonna explain this bit in a second. So this port right here, because it's very important for us but you can see that we have an image up and running. So go back to the other tab and you can see that right here. So this is actually a bit bigger now, but basically the process is hanging right here. So what I'm gonna do is simply cancel out of this. So control C, there we go. I'm gonna clear the screen there. And right here, simply type Docker container and then LS, and you can see that the container is no longer up and running. So the same here. So remember, this was a container, so Docker container LS. You can see that nothing is up and running. So what I'm gonna do now is close this tab, and I'm gonna run the container, so Docker run Nginx latest, but now what I'm gonna do is add a flag, so minus and then D. So this simply says run this container in detached mode. So if I press enter, you can see that the process is no longer hanging, so it's running in detached mode. And then we get this ID right here. So now we can view the list of all containers running. So Docker and then container and then LS enter, you can see that this is our container, which is up and running 18 seconds ago. So let me go ahead and clear the screen. Another way that you can check the list of running containers is simply type Docker and then PS. So this is the preferred way and much faster. Enter and you can see that we get the same thing. And now you can see everything is the same apart from the actual name right here. So suspicious Snyder and the port is the same. So this port right here, I'm gonna explain next, but this is very important for us to understand. So 80 and then TCP. And there we go. So you successfully managed to run your very first container by running docker run minus D in detached mode, and then the name of the actual container. So Nginx, column, and then a latest. Next, let's go ahead and learn exactly how we're going to be able to use the container. Let's go ahead and learn about how to expose ports with Docker. So, so far we have our host, which has Docker running. So we are running Docker in our computer. And right now we have one single container, which is running Nginx. And this container is exposing a TCP port and the port is 80. So let me show you exactly this again. So right here, you can see that we have ports and then 80 and then forward slash TCP. So what we wanna be able to do is from the host, we want to issue a request to our 
container which is exposing port 80. So we want to be able to go to our web browser, type localhost 8080, and then that port 8080 should be mapped to port 80 on the container. So basically we want to go from the host to the container. And the way that we achieve this is simply by adding dash P before we run the container. So dash P 8080 from the host should be mapped on port 80 on the container. And then we'll be able to access the application running from within the container. So let's go ahead and open up terminal or command line. And what I'm going to do first is stop this container. So to stop a container, simply type docker and then stop and then pass the container ID. So I'm going to command C that command V and then enter. And you can see that the container has stopped. So if I type docker PS, you can see that nothing is running. Let me clear the screen. So I'm going to issue the same command. So docker run minus D or dash D. And then let's go ahead and say dash and then P. And we want to go from the host. So whenever we type localhost 8080, we want that to be mapped to port 80 on the container. So press enter. And you can see that the container is up and running docker ps and there we go so now you can see that the ports is a bit different so you can see that right here we are simply saying map localhost 8080 to port 80 inside of the container now let's go ahead and open up anywhere browser and then simply type localhost and then column 8080 and then enter. And there we go. So you can see that we have this welcome page that says welcome to Nginx. And there we go. So we've managed to map the host port 8080 to the container port 80. So let me go ahead and pretty much just stop this container. So Docker and then stop and then pretty much just get the ID. There we go. If I now refresh, you can see that the site can't be reached. So we've mapped port 8080, but you could also map a different port. So let's go ahead and map port 3000. There we go. Now, if I change this to port 3000 and you can see that it's working, but from a different port. We could also map both port 8080 and port 3000 to port 80 inside of the container. So let's go ahead and do that. So let me go ahead and simply stop the container. So I think this will be now a different container. So let me go ahead and simply say Docker and then PS grab the ID Docker stop. There we go. Clear the screen control L. Now, if you want to map more than one port, simply add another dash P. 8080 to port 80. Enter. Now, if I type Docker PS, you can see that right here, localhost 3000 maps to port 80 inside of the container, and localhost 8080 also maps to port 80 inside of the container. So let's go ahead and test this out. So if I refresh, this should work. So 3000 works and now 8080 and this also works. There we go. You now know how to map ports from the host to containers. 
If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Let's go ahead and learn exactly how to stop, remove, start, and name containers. So if I go ahead and type Docker PS, you can see that currently we have this container right here. So this is the ID and it's mapping both port 3000 and 8080 to 80 inside of the container. So this is what we have currently, right? So this is the Nginx localhost 8080. This works and localhost 3000. This works. So the way that you stop containers is simply by saying Docker and then stop and then you can pass the ID or the actual name. So let's go ahead and grab this name right here. So command C, paste that in and then enter. And you can see that we get the name back. Now, if I check my web browser, refresh, you can see that it's not working because we stopped the container. Now, an interesting thing is we've just stopped the container but we haven't removed it. So the container is still available for us to start. So to start the container, simply grab the same name and say Docker, start, and then the same name or the actual container ID. Enter. You can see that I get the name back. If I check my web browser, and there we go. So you can see that the page is working again. Now, let me go ahead and stop this container. So it's Docker stop. And this time I pass the actual ID. And let me clear the screen for now. Refresh the web browser. You can see that it's not working. If I go back, so how do you know the list of containers that are not running? So if I type Docker PS, you can see that we have no containers right here. But indeed, what this command does, so Docker PS, it simply lists the running containers. So we'll go ahead and type Docker and then PS dash dash help. And right here, you can see that you can pass some options. So dash A for all, and you can see that the default shows just running. And you can do some filtering, you can do quiet, that displays only the numeric IDs, and you can check the size as well. So let me go ahead and simply clear the screen and type docker ps dash and then a. And you can see that we have a couple of containers right here, and all of them are nginx. So remember, up to now, we've actually stopped many containers and then we start them again. And whenever we start them, we simply got a different name. So you can see that this is a different name. This is a different name. The same here. And also the ID, right? We get a brand new container. So we've never reused existing containers. Now, how do we delete containers, right? So how do we delete containers? So to delete a container, so what you need to do is simply say docker and then rm and now you can delete a container by the actual name or container id so let's grab this very first one right here created 25 minutes ago and you can see the name is elastic sanderson paste that in enter we get the actual container back now if i type docker and then ps minus a you can see that the container is gone so if i remove that and remember uh, i've actually searched uh, before so this is the actual id that we removed and you can see that it's no longer in this list so just let me cancel out of that you could also remove every single container in one single command so you could say uh, docker rm and then you could say i want to delete that one and then you'd say i want to delete this one as well so docker rm but you can see that it's a bit tedious so what we can do 
is grab every single ID and then pass that into a command and then we will delete everything. So the way we do it is simply, so if I uh, click screen, so docker ps dash dash help, you can see that we have this quiet, so display only numeric IDs. So let's go ahead and say docker ps dash and then a, meaning that I want every single container, including the ones which are stopped, and then Q for quiet, that gives me only the numeric IDs. If I press enter, you can see that I've got only five. So if I want to remove all of these, I simply type docker and then rm and then press dollar sign. And within dollar sign, simply say docker ps minus a and then q, right? So we're simply getting this command and passing it inside here. And this will remove every single container that we have. Now, bear in mind that if you have a container that is running, this won't work. So let, just let me uh, first delete and then you'll see it. So if I remove everything, you can see that I get every single ID back. Now, if I type docker ps minus a, you can see that we have no containers available. Now, let me go ahead and start a container. So if I click screen, so let me search here. So 3000 and let me go ahead and start this container. There we go. Docker PS, you can see that it's running. If I refresh the browser, there we go. Now, if I go ahead and simply uh, try and remove the container, right? So let's go ahead and, and run this exact same command. So Docker RM and then give me all the containers. So if I press enter, it says that you cannot remove a running container. Stop the container before attempting removal, or you can do a force RM. So the way that force RM works, so you simply pass dash F, and it simply says that I really don't care whether it's running, I simply want to remove the container, and that's it. So if I press enter, you can see that that took a while, and I get the ID back. So if I refresh the page, you can see that we have no containers. Now, if I do a Docker PS, and there we go, Docker PS minus A, enter, and we have no containers available. If you have any questions on stopping, starting, and removing containers, go ahead and drop me a message. Next, let's go ahead and learn how to name containers. All right, let's go ahead and start a container. So simply type docker run minus D minus P and then expose whatever ports that you want and then press enter. So if I type docker PS, you can see that we have a name right here. So elegant and then ride. So usually this is a random name that is given to you if you don't specify a name. But in reality, when you create your own containers, you should be giving them a name so that you don't rely on the ID nor the actual random name, right? So the way that you give a name to a container is simply by using dash dash and then name. So let's go ahead and simply stop this container. So Docker, um, well actually, let's go ahead and force uh, remove everything. So Docker RM dash F Docker PS and then uh, dash AQ enter. There we go. So now let's go ahead and run the exact same command. So Docker run minus D. So what I'm going to do is go to the start and then right here, simply go ahead and type dash dash and then name. And now we can give this a name. So let's go ahead and simply say that this will be our website, right? So now if I press enter, you can see that the container is running. But if we type Docker PS, you can see that now the name is website. And this makes your life much easier 
for you to identify your containers. And trust me, you should always name your containers because most likely you'll be running multiple containers at the same time. So now I can simply go ahead and say Docker, stop, and then website. And you can see that I don't have to rely on the actual container ID. I could use it, but because I've named my container, I can simply say stop my website just like that. So if I press enter, you can see that stop the website and I can simply start it again. So Docker start and then website. So there we go. You now know how to name containers. All right, let's go ahead and learn exactly how we're going to take a Docker PS and format this result right here. So you can see that sometimes it might be a bit difficult for you to read what's going on. So you can see that we have container ID and then the ID it's right here. And then we have the status and the status goes over to the next line. And then we have the image and you can see that the ports then it's yeah, sometimes it's very difficult for you to read. Let's actually go ahead and start a second container. So Docker and then run and then minus D minus P and then Nginx and then latest. And let me actually name this. So that dash name and then website and then two and the port as well. So let's go ahead and simply map at 9000 to port 80. So press enter. You can see that it's running. So if I do a Docker PS now, you can see that I've got two uh, containers up and running and the output is a bit, it's even harder to read actually. So what we can do is simply use a format. So we can say Docker PS and then minus minus format. And this is equal to, and what I'm going to do is simply copy some code right here. But basically, this simply um, gives a label, and then tab, and then right here, it grabs the actual ID, the same with name, and then names, image, and then image, ports, so on and so forth. And you can get this entire line in the description of this video. So let me go ahead and simply command C, go back. And what I'm going to do is simply paste that in. And this has to be within quotes. And if I now press enter, you can see that now the format is much nicer. So you can see that we have the ID, the name, image, port, command, created, status. And basically it's much easier for you to read if you don't have enough room. So what I like to do with this is simply export uh, to a variable. So format equals to and then paste that again. Oh, actually, I need to paste this again. So copy and then paste that enter. And now if I type Docker PS, you can see that it's not formatted. And if I type Docker PS, dash dash and then format equals to dollar sign and then format. So this is the name of the variable. So this dollar sign format refers to this variable right here. So if I press enter and let me do that again so you can see exactly nice and neat. And there we go. So you can see that it's formatted. And there we go. You now know how to format the results of Docker PS. All right, in this section, let's go ahead and learn about Docker volumes. So Docker volumes allows us to share data. This could be files or folders. So you can see on the diagram that I have here that you have a container and then you have the file system and under that you have the Docker area. And through the container and the file system, you create a volume. So I'm going to show you exactly this in a second, how it works. But volume simply allows us to share data between host and container and also between containers. 
So the way it works is that you have a container running on a host. And in our case, we have an Nginx container. So one, we have to create the volume. And then this volume allows you to share data between the host and container and vice versa. So let's say that we add a file in our host, in our machine. This file A will also appear in the actual container inside of the volume. The same by adding a file in the actual volume inside of the container that will also appear in my host operating system. And the same is true with folders. So if you add a folder on your host, then that will also appear in the actual container. Let's go ahead and learn exactly how to share data between host and container. All right, so go ahead and navigate to hub.docker.com and search for Nginx. And right here, what I want to show you is exactly how we're going to be able to serve our own files during development with Nginx. So scroll down. And right here, you can see that hosting some simple static content. And basically, you can see that right here. So they give a name to this container. So some uh, Nginx and then dash V. And then this is the actual volume. So this bit right here is the source. And this is the destination. So inside of the container, so this path right here, so user share nginx and then html inside of that folder we can share our own files and if you are developing an application or a website that's where you should put your files in and then right here you can see that this is a read only volume so let's go ahead and pretty much create a file and then mount our directory inside of this folder so that we can override the default nginx welcome page so let me go ahead and open up terminal and docker run and then dash dash name let's go ahead and create a website so i've deleted all the previous containers and dash p and then 80 80 to 80 and then the actual um, container will be n g and then x and I can say dot latest or if I don't specify the actual tag, it will bring the latest by default. So if I run this, oh, actually, let me actually add a dash D for detached. And then if I go to my web browser, refresh, you can see that's forbidden. And this is because this is 8080. And there we go. We have this default nginx welcome page in the next video let's go ahead and override this default web page by simply mounting a volume from the host to the container all right let's go ahead and create a volume between our host and our container so inside of our desktop so in the host machine we will create a folder called website and then we're going to have an index.html. So that file or the contents inside of the website folder will be shared inside of the container in the following directory. So users share nginx and then html. So that way, when we hit the URL in our web browser, we will be served with our own files. So let's go ahead and do that now. So right here, what I'm going to do is pretty much just open up VS Code and go ahead and open up your favorite IDE. But in my case, I'm gonna open up VS Code. And then what I'm gonna do is simply create a new file. And then in this file, let's simply go ahead and have an H1. So this will be some HTML. So H1 and then hello, Docker and volumes. So we will have a better page, but for now, this will be enough. So now I'll go ahead and save this. Navigate to desktop. Inside, create a new folder. Name this as a website. 
and then create. And then name this as index.html. Press enter. And there we go. Now what I'm going to do is start a container and mount the website folder to our container. So go ahead and open up terminal. And right here, let me simply say Docker and then stop and then website. There we go. Docker RM and then web and then site. There we go. So this is completely removed. So now let's go ahead and navigate to the website folder. So CD and then desktop. And there we go. And also CD into website. So if I do an LS, you can see that we have index.html. Now let's go ahead and start a container and then mount the entire folder to our container. So the way we do it is let's go ahead and scroll up or we'll actually go up a couple of times. And now what we're going to do is so pretty much after website. So after you name the container, go ahead and simply say dash and then V. And then right here, we can simply say dollar sign and then within brackets PWD. So this simply takes uh, the present working directory. So let me actually show you. So let me cancel out of that. If I type PWD, I get the content. So this is what I get, right? So if I pass that, so I think on Windows, you simply say DIR and you get the same thing. So let's go ahead and grab this again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to mount this folder called website to and remember, so if I open up uh, Nginx, you can see that this is the actual destination. So user share Nginx HTML, and then you can say read only. So grab everything and then go back and then paste that in. And there we go. So now let's go ahead and press enter. And there we go. You can see that we have started a container. And if I now go to my web browser and then remember before we had this welcome page, which was the default presented by Nginx. Now, if I refresh, you can see that we are serving our index.html. So let's go ahead and change that. So let me go ahead and simply say hello with volumes and then let's simply say read and then only save this go back, refresh, and you can see that the contents are mounted, right? So whenever we change the index or HTML, that is reflected in our container. So what I'm going to do now is I want to show you that if we have a file inside of the container, that will also appear in our host. So go ahead and simply type this Docker and then exec and then dash it and then simply say website and then bash so this this simply says that we want to execute this in interactive mode pass the actual uh, container and then we want to execute the bash command so if i press enter you can see that now we are inside of the container so if i if i type ls dash al you can see that this is the Linux file structure inside of our container. So remember, this is the running container. So now remember, we mounted so user share nginx HTML. So let's go ahead and navigate to that. So CD and then user share nginx HTML. And then if I clear the screen, if I do an LA or actually LS dash AL, you can see that we have our index.html. Now let's go ahead and simply say touch and then about dot HTML. And this is just a file with nothing inside. So if I press enter, you can see that this is a read only volume, which means that the container can only read the contents. If it wants to add, if it wants to write to it, it's impossible. 
So the way that you tackle that, so let's go ahead and exit this container. So control and then D and then Docker PS. Let's go ahead and simply say Docker RM dash F and then website. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is simply run the exact same uh, container but right here instead of passing the read only flag I'm going to remove that enter now let's go ahead and bash into the container again so docker exec dash it website and then bash enter cd to user and then share nginx html if I clear the screen now, if I do an LS, you can see that we have index.html. If I touch about.html, press enter, you can see that works. Now, if I go to my desktop and you can see that we have this folder right here called website. So I'm going to open it up and you can see that we have the about.html right here. So from our container, this file also appears in our host and you can see that this still works and there we go this is how you share files between the host and containers using volumes if you have any questions go ahead and drop me a message otherwise join me in the next video All right, let's go ahead and customize our website. So this website right here, which simply says hello Docker and volumes. And by the way, that's not read only anymore. So let me go ahead and remove that. And if I visit the page again, refresh, you can see that hello Docker and volumes. So go ahead and navigate to Google and do a search on bootstrap single page template. So go ahead and click on this very first link. So free bootstrap for landing page themes. And right here, go ahead and pick any website of your choice. So what I'm going to do is pretty much just pick this one right here. So grayscale and then click on view on GitHub. There we go. So now let's go ahead and simply clone or download. Let's go ahead and download the zip. Now open this in your desktop and then let me unzip this. There we go. Delete the zip. And what I'm going to do is pretty much just take everything. So I'm going to take everything here, command C and then go to my website and then let's delete everything and then paste. There we go. So we can see that we have this index.html and we can go ahead and delete this folder. So bootstrap grayscale master, delete that. And there we go. So now I'm inside of the container. So I'm going to do an LS minus AL. You can see that we have the files that we've just downloaded. So what I'm going to do now is simply visit the web page. So I'm going to close this and this as well and go ahead to localhost 8080 before we had hello docker and volumes. Now, if I refresh, you can see that we have this awesome website and feel free to make changes to this website according to your needs. So you can see that this works beautifully, right? So you can see that we have a, a nice, beautiful website. So I can click on projects. You can see that takes me to projects, contact, and there we go, right? So let me go in about, and you can see that it's built with bootstrap and you can see that it's working beautifully. And there we go. I just wanted to show you that you don't have to have a boring website as we had. So you can go ahead and build your own website and then deploy it with Nginx. All right, now let's go ahead and learn how to share volumes between containers. So we have a container A and we have a container B 
and we can share a volume between them, i.e. we can share the contents of a folder or a file between these two containers. So let's go ahead and try that out. So currently we have this Nginx container named website and it's serving our beautiful website. So you can see that running on localhost 8080. The way that we can share files or folders between containers is by using a command volumes from. So go ahead and type docker run dash dash help. And this give and this will give you all the options that you can use with Docker Run. Enter, and you can see that at the very bottom, you, you have volumes from. So dash dash volumes from, and then mount volumes from the specified container. So let's go ahead and clear this, and then Docker PS. So let's go ahead and start a brand new container. So Docker Run and then dash dash name. Let's go ahead and call website dash copy and then dash and then D minus and then P. So this will be 80, 81 to 80. So port 80 is already been used. So we have to map to a different port and then go ahead and simply say N G and then next. And right here, what we need to do is simply say volumes, right? Because we want to map a volume from this running container. So the way you do it is dash dash volumes dash and then from, and then you pass the actual name. So the name of the container is website. Now let's go ahead and press enter. And you can see that it's up and running Docker. Oh, actually, let me press up two times, clear the screen, you can see that we have two containers running. One container is available through 8081, so that's the port, and this is the website copy, and the website is through our 8080 port. So let's go ahead and give that a go. So open up your web browser. So 8080, so this is the main website. So refresh, you can see, you can see that this still works. Now, if I go ahead and hit the 8081, which is the website copy container, and we shared all the contents from the website container to the website copy container, this container should have the exact same website. So if I press enter, you can see that still works. So we've managed to share data across these two containers. All right, in this section, let's go ahead and learn exactly how to use Dockerfile to build our own images. So far, we've been using existing images, i.e. the Nginx image. And from that, we've been running containers. So what a Docker file allows us to do, it allows us to create our own images by creating a file called Docker file. And this file simply contains a list of steps of how to create images. And then we can run images built from Docker files as we've been running existing images. Let me go ahead and show you the documentation that you need when building Docker images. All right, so right here, this is the Docker file reference. So in this page, you can find every single command that you can use when building images. So as I mentioned before, Dockerfile, it's simply a series of steps that defines how your image is built. So in this page right here, you can see that they have quite a lot of things, but if I scroll down, you can see that they have, um, you know, stuff with environment replacement, uh, Docker ignore, and then the from keyword. So every single uh, Docker file has to have this from um, keyword. So I'm going to explain this in a second. And then you have the run command. And then you have the CMD command. You've got label, you've got expose, you've got add, you've got copy, entry point, you've got args, 
you've got a bunch of these commands that allows you to build Docker images. Let's go ahead and create our very first Docker file and then create an image from it. All right, let's go ahead and take this beautiful website and build an image using a Docker file. And then we can pretty much run as many containers that we want from our custom image. So far, we've been mounting a volume. So if I show you exactly what, what we've been doing. So right here in this command, so we've been mounting a volume from the host to the container. So this is why you can see this beautiful website. So, we're, so we are taking all the index or HTML, all the JavaScript, uh, pretty much. So if I uh, do an LS here, or actually LL, so you can see that we have a bunch of things. So we have CSS, images, JS, uh, vendor. So basically we have everything and then we mount a volume inside the container and then we are able to view this awesome website like this. So this is really good for development purposes. So you want to mount the volume when you are doing uh, stuff in development. But when you want to build a custom image, you don't need to mount a volume from your host to the actual container. So what you ought to do is to copy. So you want to copy everything everything into your image, right? So when you actually defining how you want to create an image, you ought to copy this so that you don't have to mount a volume. So let's go ahead and learn exactly how to do that and then run a container from it. So what I'm going to do here, so I want to pretty much just say Docker and then let me clear that. So I just press control L image and then ls and you can see that we have the nginx image so this is the latest tag and that's the one that we've been using so far and i've gone ahead and deleted all the previous containers and i'm only left with one container which is running our website so docker ps watch oh, let me format this so like that so you can see that so that and that so you can see that we have one image and we also have one container which is running based off this image. So what we want to do now is create our custom image and then run a container from it. So right here, we don't need to mount a volume anymore if we are building our own image that contains everything. And remember, images should contain everything that your application needs to run. So it should contain uh, all the dependencies, all the source code, pretty much everything that your application needs to run. And that's what we're going to do now. So go ahead and open up VS Code or any IDE and open up the website folder. So inside of this website folder, let's go ahead and create a Docker and then file. So this must be named as Docker file and make sure that this is inside of the root folder. So inside of the website folder. So right here, the very first command that we're going to learn is the from keyword. So from keyword, is the name of the base image that we want to use. So usually when you build your own images, you will never build an image from scratch. You will always use an existing image as your base image and then produce your own image. So in our case, we want to use the nginx and then column and then latest. So you've seen this already. So when we say Docker run, we're running this image right here. So we want to build an image based off this image right here. So this image called Nginx. Now the second command that we're going to do is we're going to say add. 
So let's go ahead and say add and then simply say dot. And then we want to add everything in the current directory. So CSS, image, JavaScript, pretty much everything right here into a destination. And if you remember correctly, so the destination that we want to add is this one right here. Right. So this is where the static content should live if you want to serve static content with Nginx. So let me go ahead and simply paste that in. So this is from and then this is the actual destination. And let me go ahead and save this. And this is pretty much a very simple Docker file that will produce an image. Now that we have a Docker file, next, let's go ahead and learn how we're going to build an image from this Docker file. All right, now that we have our Docker file, now let's go ahead and build an image from it. So go ahead and open up terminal or command line if you are on Windows and make sure to navigate to the website. So right here, if I do an LS or actually LA, you can see that I have my Docker file right here. So the way that we build images from Docker file, it's simply by running this command. So we need to say Docker and then build. So we want to build and we have to specify few parameters. So at least we must specify the tagging. So how we want to tag this image. So go ahead and simply say dash dash tag or simply dash and then T. So let me go ahead and say dash dash and then tag. And in fact, let me show you the commands. So Docker build and then dash dash help. So here you can see the list of all the commands that you can use when building from a Docker file. So right here, so this is the one. So dash T or dash dash tag. So name and optionally a tag in the name and then the actual tag. So this is the format, right? So let's go ahead and simply clear this. So let's go ahead and say Docker and then build and then dash and then dash tag so that you remember that dash T is dash dash tag. And then let's go ahead and give it a name. So the most obvious name is website. And then right here, let's simply go ahead and give this a tag. So the tag will be latest. And I'm gonna show you exactly the best way of you tagging your images later on. But for now, let's simply go ahead and say that the name Right. So when you tag, you say that the first part is the name. So the name is website and then the version is latest. So the same way that you saw with Nginx. So if I cancel out of this for now, so Docker and then image and then LS. So right here, you can see that the name is Nginx and then the tag is latest. And the way that we refer to it is simply saying N and then Nginx and then column latest. So we are doing the same thing for our own image. So let's go ahead. So let me go ahead and simply grab this and then clear the screen, control L, paste that in. And then the last thing that you have to specify is where is your Docker file. So my Docker file is inside of this directory called website. So simply go ahead and add a dot. So this will look for a Docker file and then build an image from it. Now let's go ahead and press enter. And you can see that we have built an image. So you can see that right here we had two steps. So the from, so this is the actual um, line one right here. So, so this is the base image. And then you can see that we have the step two, which simply added everything in the current directory to this destination inside of our container. And you can see that we have uh, some random numbers here, and I'm gonna explain this in a second. 
and you can see that we built an image and we successfully tagged it as a website and then latest. Now, if I go ahead and simply say Docker image and then LS, and now you can see that we have two images and this is our image. So you can see that the, the repository is website, the tag is latest, the image ID. So this is the image ID, which is this one right here. And you can see that it was created about a minute ago. And then the size of it is 135 megabytes. So there we go. Now that we have an image, let's go ahead and run a container from it. So let me go ahead and click the screen and do a Docker PS format. And let me go ahead and simply um, stop this container. So Docker. Or in fact, let me go ahead and remove this container. So Docker RM and then dash F and then website. There we go. You can see that we have uh, no containers running. There we go. Everything is empty. And let me actually see if we have any containers which are currently stopped. So Docker PS dash A and then you can see that everything is empty. That's fine. Now let's go ahead and pretty much just do a Docker and then image ls and let's run a container based off this image right here called website. So let's go ahead and simply say docker and then run dash dash name. Let's give it a name website. And then right here, let's simply say dash p for the port. So this will be 8080 from the host to port 80 inside of the container and then Let's go ahead and also say that we want to run this in detached mode. So dash D or minus D. And finally, the image that we want is website and then column latest. And if I go ahead and press enter, you can see that we get this huge ID back. If I do a Docker PS, you can see that we have a container running and it's running our own image. So the, 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 the image right here is the website latest. And you can see the name, the ID, and it's mapping port 8080 from the host to 80 inside of the container. And the crucial thing here is that we are not mounting any volume. So this image contains everything that our application needs in order to run. Now let's go ahead and test this in our web browser and then this was the previous one. So now if I refresh, you can see that this still works. So if I open up Safari and then a local host and then 8080, there we go. You can see that our website is working beautifully. And there you go. You've successfully managed to create a Docker file and then build an image from it and run a container. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's go ahead and learn a bit more about Docker files. All right, let's go ahead and switch context and build an API using Node.js. So we're gonna pretty much just switch from this awesome website to building an API using Node.js. So go ahead and install Node.js in your machine. So for Windows and Mac users, the installation process is the exact same thing and very straightforward. So go ahead to Node.js.org and download either the recommended version or the one that contains the latest features. So once you have Node.js installed, we're going to be using this awesome framework called Express. So Express allows us to build APIs and web applications. So once you have Node.js installed, go ahead and navigate to expressjs.com. Go ahead and click on getting started and then installing. So to install is very straightforward. You need to create a folder, npm init, and then entry point. This will be the index.js. And then you simply install the express framework. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let me go ahead and open up terminal 
And what I'm going to do is come out of the, the website folder. So CD and then dot dot. And in my desktop, I'm going to create a folder. So make and then dear and then API. Oh, actually, let's name this as um, user and then service. So this user service will contain every single piece of code that deals with users. So let's go ahead and pretty much just make this lowercase u. And then this also, let's go ahead and say dash and then service and then enter. Oh, actually, let's also say API. So user service API and then enter. Let's go ahead and navigate to user service API. Now, let me show you the actual version of node that I have. So node dash dash and then version. And for you, it might be a bit different, but this will also work for you, regardless of whatever version you are using. So now let's go ahead and say NPM and then init and go ahead and pretty much just press enter a couple of times and then simply say yes, it's okay. Now inside we have this package.json. Now let's go ahead and install the express framework. So NPM install dash dash save and then express just give you a second and there we go you can see that was very fast now go back to the website and right here so on the actual header click on getting started and then hello world so right here you can see that they have an example of how to run a very simple server with one route that simply returns hello world. So go ahead and copy all of that. And what I'm going to do is open up VS code. So let me go ahead and simply open. And then in my desktop, user service API, and then open. There we go. Now, Inside, let's go ahead and create an index.js and then paste that code. So just simply paste everything and save it. Now, the way that you start this is if I go back to the terminal and you can see that we have this index.js. Now, go ahead and simply type node and then index.js. And you can see that we have a message saying example app listening on port 3000. Now let's go ahead and open up port 3000 on our web browser. So localhost port 3000, enter, and you can see that we have hello world. Now, let me go ahead and simply change this a bit. So right here, instead of returning hello world, let's go ahead and simply say res dot and then JSON and let's return a user. So name Bob and then email Bob at gmail.com. So this will be enough. Save this, go back, open up terminal again. So we need to stop this, control C, and then let me clear the screen, and then say node index.js, and there we go. App is listening on port 3000. Let's go ahead and open up Chrome again, refresh, and you can see that now we have a JSON object back. And in fact, this should be so. So let's go ahead and actually um, return an array. So an array. So an array here. And then close that one there as well. So this is a single object, but we want an array. So let me go ahead and cancel again. There we go. If I open up Chrome, refresh, and now you can see that we have an array of users. 
And there we go. So you successfully managed to create a very simple API with Express. Next, let's go ahead and Dockerize this API using a Docker file. All right, let's go ahead and Dockerize our Node application written with Express.js. So currently we have an Express app that simply has one endpoint and it simply returns a list of users. So let's go ahead and actually take all of this and create a Docker file that will allow us to produce a Docker image. So let's go ahead and create a Docker file. So Docker and then file. So now we have to choose the base image. So let's go ahead and simply say from, and if you have guessed it, so if I open up Docker and then hub, and I can go ahead and search for node, and you can see that we have one verified content. And this is the Docker official image. So this means good news as we can use node for our base image. So let's go ahead and simply say from and then node. And then let's go ahead and pick the latest tag. So I'm going to discuss tags later on. But for now, let's go ahead and use the latest tag. Next, let's go ahead and use work and then there. So work directory. So what I want to do is actually set the working directory inside of the container. So what I'm going to do is create a folder called app. So basically, this means that if you have a folder inside of the container called app, use it, otherwise create a brand new one. And then any commands that follow this line right here will be executed inside of this app folder inside of the container. Next, let's go ahead and pretty much just say add. And we want to add everything. So we want to add everything inside of this directory to the app directory. Next, let's go ahead and use the run command. So run. And right here, the run command allows us to pass few arguments. So the arguments that I want to so the argument that I want to pass is npm and then install. So basically, we want to install all the dependencies from our package.json. So this allows us to do that. And finally, once we have all the dependencies installed, we can simply go ahead and pretty much just type the same command that we did here. So right here, if I cancel this, Control C, node, and then index.js. So let's go ahead and simply say CMD for command. And the command is node and then index.js. And there you go. This is pretty much everything we need for this Docker file. Now go ahead and open up terminal or command line. And let me go ahead and pretty much just press Control C, clear the screen. Let's go ahead and simply say Docker and then build and make sure that you are inside of the user service API folder. And let's go ahead and simply name this as user dash service dash API colon and then latest. And I forgot to add dash dash tag or dash uh, T. So dash T for tag. And then where the Docker file is, is inside of this directory. So dot and then press enter. And you can see that there are five steps. So the first one is from node. You can see that it's pulling node. So these are layers, which I want to discuss later on. But for now, it's just downloading everything that it needs for step one out of five. So just give it a second. And you can see that this is the one that taking the longest. So this has um, quite a big size right here. So 215 megabytes. 
So I think this was me actually um, dragging this. So just give it a second. And you can see that this ID right here is the same as that one. So just bear with me. Now it's extracting. There we go. So you can see that now it's doing the, oh, actually this is very fast, but basically you can see that it's finished, but let me show you exactly what it's doing. So the step two was creating the app directory and then step three out of five was adding everything from our local machine to the container. And then step four was running NPM install to download and install all the dependencies. And then step five is the command. So when this container starts, what command shall be executed? Note and then index.js. And you can see that this is the image ID and this was the actual tag. So user service, API, and then latest. And this was actually me copying and pasting. So ignore this. And there we go. Now we have an image for the user service API written with Node and Express.js. Let's go ahead and run a container from the image that we've just built. And what I'm gonna do is make sure that the API is not up and running. So let me go to localhost port 3000. You can see that it's not up and running. Now, let me go ahead and check the list of images that I have, Docker, image, and then LS. And you can see that we have two extra images. So this one, node, and the one that we've just built. So user service API, so you can see the tag as well. So the tag is latest and the image ID created at and also the size. So now let's go ahead and pretty much run a container from this image right here. So to do that, let's go ahead and simply say Docker and then run dash dash name. Let's name it as user and then dash API and the actual um, and then dash D for detached, dash and then P for mapping the host port to the container port. So let's map the port 3000 and remember correctly. So if I open up Chrome, it was running on port 3000. So this is the port that Express.js listens on by default. So let's go ahead and pretty much just map to that. So the host 3000 will map to container port 3000. And then let's go ahead and pass the actual image. So user dash service dash API and then column. And then the tag is latest. And I can see that I've got a mistake. So this should be Docker and then run, not rum. And then press enter. And there we go. Now go ahead and simply say Docker PS with format or without, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna format the PS output, enter. You can see that we have two containers. So we have the website, so this is running on port 8080. And this is the API, which is running on port 3000. So let's go ahead and test it out. So let me open up Chrome and then right here, you can see that this was running from our machine before, and now it's been containerized with Docker. So if I refresh, you can see that now it's working. And also our website is listening on port 8080 and should work, so you can see that it's working. And there we go. You've managed to containerize an express application with Docker. If you have any questions on what we did here, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. In this section, let's go ahead and learn some of the best practices when it comes to writing Docker files. So in this video, I want to cover the .docker ignore file.
So, so far, you've seen that we wrote this Docker file right here that says from node latest. And then we set the working directory right here. And then any command that follows will be executed inside of this folder called forward slash app. So you can see that right here, we simply add all the contents within the host. So all of these files to this folder right here called app inside of the container. And then we simply run npm install. So usually when you write applications, there are certain files that you should ignore. For example, if I was to commit this API to a GitHub repository, I wouldn't necessarily commit this folder right here called node underscore modules, because this folder right here is created when we run npm install. So in fact, let me go ahead and delete it. So let me go ahead and simply delete. And then you can see that if I try to run this application, so let me go ahead and simply say uh, node and then index.js, you can see that cannot find module express. So what we do is simply say npm and then install or npm i. There we go. You can see that the packages were added and about 50 of them. Now, if I go ahead and say node and then index.js, you can see that this time this works. So what we need to do is right here. So because we don't need to include this folder to our build step inside of this Docker file, right? Because this command right here, so run npm install does it for us. We simply have to exclude this file right here. And so that you understand, by the time you run this command right here, it will include everything in this folder, including node modules. Then you will also run npm install, and that will create the node modules again. So we don't need that. So what we need to do is create a new file. And this file will be called dot, and then all lowercase docker, and then ignore and then press enter. Now, what we need to ignore is node underscore modules. And in this file, you should ignore folders or files that your Docker image does not need. So we also don't need the Docker and then file. So we don't need this Docker file. So this one right here to be added to our image, right? So it adds no value because we don't need this Docker file in order for our application to run. Finally, because I'm going to create a GitHub repository from this example right here, let me go ahead and simply add a dot and then git. So this is the git folder. And I really don't need to include that inside of my image. And for example, if you want to exclude files ending in certain ex extensions, you simply say, for example, a file, um, or actually you'd say star. So any file ending in, for example, dot, and then um, gulp, for example, dot JS, something like that. Uh, if you want folders, you'd say folder, and then forward slash, and then any folder under that, right? And this is pretty much it. So I'm going to ignore node modules, Docker file and dot git. So now if I go ahead and save this, and let's go ahead and pretty much cancel out of this. Let's go ahead and build the image. So Docker build. And in fact, let me check the image name. So Docker image ls. So the image was user service API. So docker build dash t paste that. Let's also go ahead and simply say latest and then dot enter. And you can see that it's running. It added 50 packages. So this was the npm install. And there we go. And this is how you use the dot docker ignore file. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on.
In this video, let's go ahead and learn about layers and caching when building images from our Docker file. So pretty much every one of these steps, so step one to five, they do create layers and a layer is used in caching. So how is this important to us? So what I'm going to do is pretty much open up terminal and right here, let's go ahead and install a few dependencies npm install dash capital S. Let's go ahead and install react web pack. And then let's also go ahead and install gulp and grant. So basically I'm just installing random packages that you don't necessarily need. So this is only for demonstration purposes. So go ahead and press enter. And you can see that this will take a while. So it will download react webpack gulp and grunt. So just bear with me. And there we go. You can see that it added few packages and this took a while. So now let's go ahead and open up our code. And what I want to do here is open up index.js. And if I make this smaller so you can see everything. So right here, let's simply go ahead and add another user. So let's call this Alice and then Alice at and then hotmail.com. Now let's go ahead and build an image from this. So go ahead and pretty much just uh, press up a couple of times. And what I'm going to do is uh, this one. So I need this command docker build dash T user service API and then latest and then dot. So you've learned about this. So now go ahead and press enter. And you can see that these are the steps and each step. So you can see that right here. So this step is using cache. So you can see that it's using the cache, right? So just give it a second. And you can see that now this will take a lot longer because we are installing a bunch of dependencies and you can see that it's finished, right? So the point really here is that you can see that step one is pulling the node image. So latest and then work directory is using the cache, but really there is not much going on inside of this work directory. So this is simply saying create this folder if it doesn't exist, otherwise use it. And then we add the source code right here and then we run npm install. So if I run the application, so let's go ahead and run. So run just like that. Press enter and there is a container already. So let me go ahead and say docker rm and then dash f user dash API. There we go. That's gone. So if I run this again and then open up my web browser and if I refresh, you can see that we have two users right here. So we have Bob and Alice. Now let's go ahead and add a third user. So right here, let's go ahead and add Jake, Jake, and then add and then yahoo.com save this now let's go ahead and build an image again with our changes so go ahead and pretty much just say docker build basically the same command press enter and you can see that it's running the same thing so basically from node right here using the cache adding our source code right here and then running npm install. And you can see that took a while. So the thing here is that we can do way better than this. So we can take advantage of caching because the only thing that we have changed was the source code. So because the source code has changed, right? So let me go back to the Docker file that we built. So because this step has changed, Docker has to recompute every single step that comes after this. So 
the way to improve this and to make sure that we do not run npm install and download and install dependencies all over again, we can simply take advantage of caching. So let's go ahead and think how we might improve this Docker file. So we know that what we need from this Docker file is two things. We need the package.json and package-log.json. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the working directory. And now here I'm going to say add, and then I'm going to say package, and then star dot json. So basically, uh, I actually missed the dot right here. So we want to add package.json to the working directory, which is app. So basically, now we are adding the package.json, right? And what we're going to do is pretty much uh, run npm install. And then after that's complete, we're going to add the source code. So we're going to add everything from the current directory right here to our working directory inside of the container, which is app. And then we're going to run node and then index.js. So this will improve things dramatically because we don't often change what's inside of the package.json surely at the beginning of development, but once the software is mature enough, we don't necessarily add too many dependencies. So we can simply use caching, right? And then Docker will know whether the contents of package.json or package-log.json changed, and then recompute everything all over again. If not, it will just skip this step, use whatever it's been cached, and then pretty much just add the source code and then run node and then index.js. And this will be way much faster. So let's go ahead and give that a go. So let's go ahead and build. So let's go ahead and build this for the first time. So docker build minus T user API and then call them latest. And it says when using add with more than one source file, the destination must be a directory. So what I need to do is simply say forward slash and then dot. And this should work. And I think I got mistakes. So this should be dot and then forward slash like that. And let's go ahead and give that one more try. So Docker build. And there we go. So it's working now. So you can see that right here. So it's pulling the node image. Is using the cache for the working directory and it's added the package and package dot or actually package dot json and then a package dash lock dot json and then right here it run an npm install right and this is done so right here so you can see that step five was simply adding the source code and then step six and then step six is the actual command so node index.js so now let's go ahead and pretty much just add a fourth user. So right here. So let's go ahead and add Maria and Maria at Yahoo dot and then com dot UK, something like that. And then let's go ahead and go back. And now let's watch this closely. So now if I build an image from this Docker file, guess what? So you can see that this was so, so much faster. And why? It was simply because of this step right here. So right here, you can see that it's using cache, which it wasn't before. And the same for the package and then start.json. So nothing has changed there. And in fact, you can see, so let me start from the top. So right here using cache. So this is for the working directory, the same for adding package.json, the same for npm install right here. So this is awesome. And then the only thing that changed was the source code, which was inside of this step. And this is much better because now we are using caching and you can see that building images this way 
was much, much faster. So bear in mind when you create your Docker files to think exactly what will change and what will not and try and make use of caching whenever is possible. Now let's go ahead and test this by bringing up a container from this new image. So let me go ahead and check the images that I have. So Docker PS, let me clear that. And we have this user API. So let's go ahead and stop it. So Docker RM dash F. So we going, so we want to stop and remove. And let's go ahead and simply say user API. Now let's go ahead and simply start user dash API like that. And this will be using the new image. So press enter. There we go. Now if I open up my web browser, and then right here, let's go ahead and refresh. You can see that it's working. We have Maria right here. So Maria was the last user that we added. And there we go. Now we have an understanding of Docker caching and layers. Go ahead and drop me a message if you have any questions. Otherwise, join me on the next one. All right, in this video, let's go ahead and learn how we're going to improve our image sizes with Docker. So let's go ahead and simply uh, check the images that we have. So Docker and then image LS. And right here, you can see that we have a couple of images. So we have our custom image that we've been working with. So user service API latest. And we also have the website image node and an nginx so if you look carefully so we have this size column right here and you can see that the size is to be honest quite large so this is almost one gigabyte right but then if you look into this website the nginx one right this is based off nginx the size is 135 megabytes now when building images and pulling images, you will see that the time that it takes to download these images is quite large. So one way to reduce the image size is to use the Linux Alpine distribution. So what I want to do is actually show you exactly what it is. So go ahead to alpinelinux.org. And right here you can read about it, but basically this is a is an independent non-commercial general purpose Linux distribution designed for power users who appreciate security, simplicity, and efficiency. And right here you can see that the key points are it's small, and you can see that a container requires no more than eight megabytes, and a minimal installation to disk requires 130. So you can see that you know, the sizes here are really tiny, really minimal. It's, it's simple and it's secure. So go ahead and read more about the Alpine Linux distribution. But what I want to show you exactly is how we can reduce the file size of our images, because this is very important when you start building a bunch of Docker images. So let's say that you have 100 Docker images, right? So one, you will fill up your Docker registry very quickly. So you run out of space and we're going to touch about Docker registries later. And the other one is actually, you know, speed. And also in the actual images that we have, sometimes we don't need everything in it. So that's why we use the Alpine image. So let's go ahead and learn exactly how we are going to reduce the file size of our Docker images. All right, so pretty much every single Docker image out there has an Alpine version, or actually an Alpine tag. So right here, you can see that we have a node. So this is an ours, and we also have Nginx, and they are using the latest tag. So let me go ahead and show you the actual um, image. So this one is for node, and right here, you can see that they have supported tags. So by default, when we don't use a tag, we pretty much just get the latest tag or as we've been 
using tags throughout this video, we've, we have simply been using the latest tag. So right here, you can see that they have a bunch of tags and the one that we've been using is node. But you can see that, for example, you have uh, 8.16.0 and then Jesse. Um, you've got Buster. But more importantly, the ones that we care, right, because we want to reduce the file size, is the Alpine version. We can see that 8.16.0 and then Alpine. And then you have 8-Alpine. So let's go ahead and pretty much just pull an Alpine image and then investigate the actual size. So let's go ahead and simply say Docker and then pull. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull node and then say column and then LTS for latest and then dash and then Alpine. Now let's go ahead and press enter. And you can see that this is pulling the image from library dash node. And you can see that this is 21 megabytes and pretty much it's done. So you can see that it was very, very quick. So let me actually go ahead and pretty much just clear the screen, Docker image LS. And now take a look at this. You can see that now our node image, so latest Alpine, it's only 75 megs. So we went down from almost a gig to 75 megabytes. So this is insane. And you saw that to pull this image was like very, very fast. And remember previously when we pulled this image right here, right? So when we pull this image, this took ages. So, you know, I had to wait because my internet connection was slow, but right here you saw that pulling this image was very, very fast. Let's go ahead and do the same for Nginx. So go ahead and simply say Docker pull, and let's go ahead and search for the latest uh, Nginx tag. So let me go ahead and pretty much just navigate and search for Nginx. And let's look at the tags that they have. So you can see that they have also Alpine, right? And they have latest. So let's go ahead and pretty much just say that we want the latest, actually Nginx here first. So this is the um, name, so repository name. So NGNNX column latest dash Alpine. Press enter. And you can see that it's actually not called nginx dash um, or nginx column latest alpine. So, so I think that okay, I got mixed up here. So basically, uh, if we want alpine, we simply say alpine, and then it will get the version, right? So basically, these are the versions, and if you don't include the version, right? So if we simply say alpine it will get the latest one. So let's go ahead and pretty much just run the same command again. And instead of latest, we simply say Alpine. Enter. And there we go. So now you can see that it's pulling the image. And this was like very fast. So let's go ahead and clear the screen. And then Docker image LS. Enter. And now let's look at this. So basically we now have two Nginx images. So this one was the latest, right? And this one is the Alpine version. And you can see that the size, this one is pretty much tiny in comparison with this one. This one is 126 megabytes and this one is only 21 megabytes. And this is awesome. There we go. You now know how to reduce the image file size by using the Alpine Linux distributions when pulling Docker images. Next, let's go ahead and change our own images. So this one user service API to use an Alpine version and the same for our website. Let's go ahead and change our custom images to use the Alpine version. 
and you will see that the size will become much smaller. So let's go ahead and change for the user service API and the same for our website. So let's go ahead and open up VS Code or your favorite IDE. And I'm inside of our API. And what I'm going to do here is pretty much change this to Alpine. And I think that right here we use the uh, LTS Alpine. So let's actually double check what's the difference between Alpine and LTS Alpine. So let me actually go ahead and go to Docker or actually Node. So Node. And right here, so we have the Alpine version and LTS and then dash Alpine. So basically, I think I've used this one previously, but we also have the Alpine right here. So let's actually use the Alpine. So what I'm going to do is pretty much just say node and then Alpine here, save that. And let's also go ahead and say Docker RM, or actually image RM, and then node, and then get the actual ID. So let's remove this image. There we go, that's gone. And let's do a Docker pool, and then node, colon, all, and then pine. So I think this is much better. There we go. And you can see that this will be super fast. There we go. That's done. So if I do a Docker LS image, or actually image LS, you can see that we have node Alpine right here, and it's only 79 megabytes. So that's fine. Now let's go ahead and change the actual uh, website. So let's go ahead and open up website. So file and then open and desktop and then website. And right here, this will be Nginx and then Alpine. Save this. Now let's go ahead and build these two images. So Docker build, and we are going to build the user service API, right? So make sure that you are inside of the folder and then name this as latest and then simply say dot, press enter. And I always forget the tag. So let's go ahead and simply add a tag, build, and then dash T for tag. There we go. So you can see that now it's pulling from node Alpine. And this is taking a while because of caching. So remember that this layer right here, so this layer right here has changed, right? Therefore, we need to recalculate everything that comes after it, even the work directory. Remember before it was getting from the cache, the same for package.json and npm install. So we've changed the image. So now it's recalculating everything. So if I actually go ahead and I want to show you this. So if I build the same image again, so this was like super fast because it's using the cache right here. You can see that it's using the cache, using cache, 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 and cache because nothing has changed. Now let's go ahead and CD back and then go to website and let's go ahead and pretty much just build website. So Docker build dash T and then web site colon latest and then dot enter. And there we go. You can see that this took like, you know, probably half a second or so. And this is because there is, there isn't much that we have to do in this build because we simply are pulling Alpine and then adding the source code and that's it. So now let's go ahead and say Docker and then image and then LS. So now you can see that we have the website right here, right? So the website now is only 30 megabytes and before was 134. So 
I'm going, I'm going to explain this later on, but you can see that now we have none and none. So the repository went from none and the tag also went from none. And that's because we are overriding the tag. So it's pretty much reusing the same tag. And because you cannot have images with the same repository and tag with the same repository name and tag, it simply removes and then uses for the new build. So that's what we did. That's what it did here. So website latest is only 30 megabytes. So you can see that it went from 135 to 30. So this is a big improvement. Now let's look at our user service API. So remember, this was based off node. So this big one right here, almost a gig. So now it's actually 117 megabytes. And before you can see that right here, so this one, it was 100, it was 946 megabyte, which is almost a gig. So there you go. You can see that we've managed to improve the file size of our custom images. If you have any questions on reducing the file size, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. In this section, let's go ahead and learn the importance of tags, versioning and tagging our own images. So basically tags versioning allows you to control image version, i.e. you have full control of what image you pull and what image your application depends on. And the benefit of that is that you now avoid breaking changes. So let's say that you code against node eight today and then tomorrow node, let's say 12 comes out. If you are using the latest, then you pretty much, you know, switch to node 12 without testing whether your application works on node 12. I'm going to give you an example in a second about this. And also it's safe, right? So when you build images, you have to make sure that they are safe. You have to make sure that you fix any security patches. And with tags and versionings, you can achieve that. So let me give you an example of tags and version. So let's say that today you run Docker pool node Alpine and the current version of node is eight. Just imagine, right? The current version of node today is eight. And then tomorrow you run the exact same Docker pool command. So Docker pool node Alpine, and then the node version is 12. Now, how do you make sure that your application that you have bundled against node eight works against node 12? You don't know, right? So this could have an impact on your application and you could have lots of breaking changes. So the same if you are using node latest, right? So the Alpine version, it's pretty much the smallest Linux distribution, but it would be the same thing. So here you are pulling the node latest and it's the exact same example. Now, the better way of doing this is that you have full control. So what you do is pretty much say, I want to pull node and then you say eight dash Alpine. So right here, you are literally specifying the version that you want. And then tomorrow, if node 12 comes out, you can decide whether to switch to node 12 or not, right? But right here, you have full control of the version and tags that you are using. Let's go ahead and change our current images, both Nginx and Node, to point to a specific version and tag. All right, go ahead and open up the Docker file for our website. And let's go ahead and change this very first line. So from Nginx column Alpine to use a version, right? So Right here, we are simply depending on the latest version of Nginx, right? So the smallest distribution right here, but we want to stick to a version and have full control. Now, 
where you actually find the versions is if you go ahead and open up Docker Hub. So let's go ahead and search for Nginx and and Nginx. So this is a verified one. And right here you can see that supported tags and respective Docker file links. So right here you can see all the tags with versions. So right here you can see that. So we are using the Alpine version right here, Alpine. But what we want to do really is just is just stick to a version, right? So you can see that we have 117.2, or actually 1.17.2 dash Alpine. So you could go ahead and also try all of the other versions, but as we've discussed in this course, the Alpine is the preferred choice when building Docker images. So let's go ahead and pretty much just stick to this version right here, 1.17.2 dash Alpine. So let me go ahead and simply grab that and then simply say 1.17.2 dash Alpine. So this is my tag. Now I have full control. Let's go ahead and also do the same for our API. So go ahead and open the user service API. And there you go. So right here, you also see that we have from node and then Alpine. So let's change this to use a specific version and tag. So go back to Docker Hub. And then let me go back. And right here, you can see that you have a bunch of tags, right? So let me just quickly show you that if you go to nodejs.org right here, you can see that they have two versions right here. So they have the 10.16.1. So this is the latest recommended for most users. And then you have the latest features. So this is 12.7.0. So go ahead and pick the one that you feel most comfortable with. So I'm going to go with 10. So no 10, the recommended for most users. So let me go back to Docker Hub and we should have a version 10. And by the way, that version might be different for you depending when you watch this video. So let me actually go ahead and search for the Alpine version. And I want 10. So you can see that right here, we have 10.16.1. Right? So this is pretty much the same one. So let's go ahead and um, take this So 10.16.1. So let me go back to VS Code. And this will be 10.16.1 dash Alpine. And to be honest, this is all. So you can see that now we have full control of these versions. The next thing that we have to do is simply build these images and see th the next thing that we have to do is to build these images and make sure that everything is working fine. So next, let's go ahead and build and run the containers using these tags with a specific version. All right, let's go ahead and build images for these new tags and then run the containers. So I'm inside of the website folder. So let's go ahead and simply say Docker and then build dash T website and then column latest. And we also will learn how to tag our custom images. So for now, simply say latest and then dot. Press enter. And now you can see that it's pulling from, and you can see the tag and ver or actually the version and tag that we have specified. So Nginx 1.17.2. Let's go ahead and do the same for the API. So CD and then back a folder and then user service API. Let's go ahead and tag the same thing. So I think this was user dash service dash API and then press enter. There we go. Now you can see that this changes, right? And because I've changed the version, it's not using the cache, it has to recompute everything again. So just give it a second.
it's running npm install and there you go now if i go ahead and clear the screen and say docker and then image ls you should see that we have user service api and website now don't worry about seeing lots of none here and i'm going to explain why this is happening later now let's go ahead and run both the website and the user service api so docker and then run and let's go ahead and run that um, expose in port 3000 and it seems that we already have a container with that name so docker and then rm dash f and then grab the name and i think it should be just that so that's incorrect so docker and then ps or docker ps dash a and you can see that we have to remove user api so let's actually run the same command so it should be that so user and then dash api there we go and let's do the same for the website so website now let's go ahead and create a container or run a container for our api first and then let's run our website container so uh, website and if i search we should have website like that and then enter there we go now let me go ahead and open up chrome and if i go to localhost 8080 so this is the website you can see that this is now working with a specific version and tag and let's also do the same for our api so if i refresh you can see that this is working so now we have full control of tags and version for our docker images if you have any questions on this go ahead and drop me a message otherwise let's go ahead and learn how to properly tag our own images So before we learn how to tag our own images, go ahead and type docker image and then ls. You can see that we have four images right here that have no repository nor tag. So this is because every time we made a change and we use the same tag, so latest, so this tag right here, so website dash latest, we have to override the existing image. So what I'm going to do is actually build this and I want you to see that this will remain with four of these because it will use the cache. So if I do a Docker PS or actually image LS, you can see that we still have four. But now let's go ahead to Docker Hub and let me go ahead and search for Nginx. And let's go ahead and pretty much just use one Alpine. So this version right here. So go back to VS Code and then open website. And then right here, simply say one Alpine. Save this. And then let's go back to terminal. And then run it. So let's actually tag this again so let's now build an image for our website and use the same tag so website column latest and you can see that now it's pulling the one version one dash alpine and successfully built a tag so now remember right here so this is the one that was using this version so let me actually go back and then and comment this and save because I want this version. So this version right here, right, is for this one, but we have named it as latest. Now, if I go ahead and clear the screen and let me actually delete that and simply clear the screen again and say Docker image and then LS. Now we should see five images without a repository and tag so this will override so there we go 
you can see that now we have four and five, right? So now that you know that whenever you make a change to your image and then use the same tag, you will override the existing one, remove the repository and tag. Next, let's go ahead and learn how to properly tag our images. All right, so currently we have this website right here, right? So if I show you, so we have this website, Grail Scale, and pretty much we haven't done anything with this website. We haven't modified it, we haven't done any, anything. So usually you add features incrementally and then you have an image for a complete feature. So let's say that we want to update this website right here. Instead of grayscale, we want to say Amigos Code or your own company. So the way tagging works is what I'm going to do first is collapse that. And I'm going to build. So I'm going to build a new tag. So this time I'm going to call it a website or actually Amigos Code. And feel free to use your own name if you want. So Amigos Code website. And this is the latest. So this is the latest one. So I'm going to build this. And you can see that now if I do a Docker image LS, you can see that I have now Amigos Code website and this is the latest. Now, the way I'm going to tag this is based off latest and then use a specific version. So let's go ahead and simply use this Docker and then tag. And we want to tag from Amigos code dash web site column latest. And from that, we want to build a new tag. So let's go ahead and simply say Amigos code dash web site and then column and then one. So if I press enter, you can see that this works. And now if I do a Docker and then image LS, you can see that I have latest, right? So this is the latest version, but we also have the version number. So Amigos Code website, and then this is version one. Now, both of these images, they do have the same contents as our running website. So this one. So now what I'm going to do is open up VS Code and open up the website folder. Let me make this smaller so you can see exactly everything. Open up now index.html. Scroll to the bottom and you should see the H1 right here, grayscale and change this to Amigos Code or your own name. And you can also go ahead and change uh, this description, the same with that one. But for now, I'm going to simply save this as it is. So now I'm gonna save this and then open up Terminal. And now I have a new change. And what I'm gonna do is tag again. So I'm gonna tag this as latest. So this now is the latest image that contains our changes. So I'm going to press enter. There we go. And now watch this. I'm going to tag from latest. And then I'm going to create a new tag right here. This is a tag name. So from so tag, this is the from and then this is destination. Now here, I'm going to say this now is version two. Press enter. And if I clear the screen, Docker image LS. And there we go. So now you can see that we have Amigos code, website one, Amigos code, website two, and we also have latest. So this will always point to the latest tag number. So now let's go ahead and spin up two containers, one using the first version of the website and the other one using the 
second version of the website. And also, why not? Let's spin up the one using latest. So let's go ahead and do that in the next video. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and run a container for Amigos Code website tag and then one Amigos Code website tag and then two, right? And let's also run one for Amigos Code website and then latest. So I want you to see exactly how this works. Now, let me go ahead and clear the screen. Docker PS. So let's go ahead and kill the website. So this website right here, because we're going to reuse this port right here, 8080. So say Docker and then RM dash F and then website. There we go. And let's also delete the user API. So why not? There we go. So now if I do a Docker PS, you can see that no container is running. Now let's go ahead and run the website and then version one. So let me actually uh, copy from here. So right here, let's go ahead and say uh, Amigos code website. and then latest, and then this will be Amigos code website, and then the tag is latest. So this will be 8080. Now press enter, and there we go. Let's now change this to two. So this will be the version two, and let's go ahead and change the name because they can't be the same and the same with ports. So this will be 8081. Enter. And now let's go ahead and run the version one. And this will be on 8082. And then this will be one. So Amigos code, and then one. Well, actually, I could have said Amigos code website one for the name, but it's fine. You get the point. Now, if I press enter, you can see that they are both running. So now let's actually do some testing. So remember, right? So remember the latest one, the latest one was based off the version two, right? So if I refresh this page, you can see that now I do get Amigos code. Now let's go ahead and change this to 8081. And we should also get Amigos code because this is the version two and version two contains the latest changes. And this one running on port 80 is the tag Amigos code website and then latest and it's based of version two. So that's why they are the same. Now let's go ahead and run localhost and then 80. 82. So 8082 is running the first version of our website. Now, the content should be different because we are running a older version. If I press enter, you can see that now this says gray, gray scale. And this is the power of you having control of whatever version that you are running when you deploy your website. Because let's say that you have deployed version two. Now let's say that you had a spelling mistake and your CSS had a bug, right? So, or even like a button, right? So this button wasn't working for some reason. Now, instead of you taking time and fixing, you know, the, you know, why the button was, wasn't working and all the spelling mistakes, what you can simply do is go back to a previous version. And then while you fix it, you are guaranteed that your website was working as it was before, right? So you could go back to this version right here without no problems and then fix your bugs and then create a brand new version. So then you create a version three and then deploy that. So this is how you tag your own images using Docker. So if you have any questions on tags, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on 
and learn how we're going to push our images to a container registry. In this section, let's go ahead and talk about Docker registries. Docker registry is simply a server side application that lets you store and distribute Docker images. So far, we've been building images in our host machine, but eventually we want to take our images and store it in a server side application. So that's what Docker registry is. We also can use Docker registries for our CD CI pipelines, i.e. continuous delivery, continuous integration pipelines. So usually this is when you pretty much just spin up a bunch of images to achieve a certain task according to your pipeline. And also it's used for running our applications. So you can take your container from your host upload it to a Docker registry and then use it to run instances of your application, right? So as we've been doing, running containers. And you could use, for example, Google Cloud with Kubernetes or some of the services provided by AWS, such as Elastic Beanstalk. So the idea is that you have images in your host. So this is our current scenario as we've been doing throughout this course and you also have a Docker registry. So a Docker registry, as I mentioned, is simply a computer server that holds all of our images. And to ship images to any Docker registry is very simple. All you have to do is use a command called push, and that takes the images and puts it inside of the Docker registry. And we're going to learn about this in a second. So when it comes to Docker registry, there are two types. You have private and public registries. So it really comes down to your needs. So you might have images that you don't mind other people see it and use it, or you might have personal projects or uh, you are working on a, an application that you don't necessarily want people to have access to your image. So that's when you use a private registry. In terms of Docker registry providers, there are quite a lot of providers, but let me just mention the most popular ones. So you have Docker Hub. So this is where we've been pulling public images such as Nginx and Node. You also have key.io and also Amazon EC2 container registry. Let's go ahead and push our images to Docker Hub. All right, let's go ahead and take our images that are running the website as well as the API and store them in a container registry. So for this course, we're going to be using Docker Hub. So navigate to hub.docker and make sure that you are signed in. So Docker Hub gives us the ability to store both private and public images. So in fact, when you go to Docker Hub, so let me go ahead to Docker Hub. And right here, let's go ahead and simply search for an image. So right here, you can see that they have a bunch of images, but all of these images, they are public. So if I pretty much click on Mongo, you can see that I can pretty much just say Docker pool Mongo. So let's go ahead and also store our own images. So go ahead and pretty much, as I said, navigate to hub.docker and make sure you sign in. And then right here, you can see that they have this section here, uh, this menu item repositories. So go ahead and click on it. And there you go. So you can see that I have no repositories found. So let's go ahead and create one. And also, so just to bear in mind that you can see that they give you one private repo. So that's really, really awesome. So if you have, for example, a website or a full stack web application, you can take advantage of this private repo and then have an image that you are the only one that has full access and control to that image. So let's go ahead and create a repository. 
and you can give a description right here. You can give a description, but let's go ahead and create one first for the website. So website and then give a description. So uh, let's say main web site. And you can elaborate on this. So what I'm going to do is actually uh, select public. So I don't need this to be private because I want to share with you and then go ahead and simply say create. And there we go. So now we have a repository. So you can see that right here, the way that you push images, it's very simple. So you simply say Docker push, and then this is your account. This is the actual repository. So website, and then the actual tag name. Next, let's go ahead and learn how we're going to take an image from our host and push to our repository hosted by Docker Hub. Now that we have a repository with Docker Hub, let's go ahead and take an image from our host and push it to our repo. So you can see that right here, they have this command right here. So you can see to push a new tag to this repo, simply say Docker push, and then this is the username, and then this is the actual tagging. So what we need to do is first, let's go ahead and pretty much close this. So what we need to do is simply say Docker image and then LS. So you can see that we have few images right here. You can see that the repositories are Amigos Code website. You can see that you have Node, Nginx, a user service API. You might even have more or less than me. So what we're going to do here is simply take Amigos Code website latest, Amigos Code website one, and also two and let's push all those three images. So what we need to do here is to tag a new images according to the following. So, so the first part is username, website, and then tag name. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and simply say Docker and then tag, and then Amigos code dash website, and then column one. And then we want to tag this to Amigos code forward slash website column one. So this will be our new image right here. So let's go ahead and press enter. Let's do the same. So right here will be two. And then this is two. So remember tagging. So this is the source. So the source is this one. So Amigos code dash website two which is this one. And then this is the actual new name. So Amigos code forward slash website column two, which is pretty much uh, the same as this one right here, right? So I'm following this standard. So let me go back and then press enter. And let's also take latest and latest here, right? So we have a latest right here. So this one. Now press enter. If I do a Docker image ls, you can see that now we have Amigos code forward slash website. And then this is one Amigos code forward slash website two and Amigos code forward slash website and then latest. Now, the way that we push these images is first you have to log in. So you can see right here in this Docker logo. So you can see that I'm already signed in. So let me go ahead and actually log out. And you can log in in two ways. So one, you can pretty much click on the logo on the Docker logo again and then sign in. And right here, you simply add your credentials or using the terminal, simply type Docker and then log in. Go ahead and type your username. So my one is Amigos code and then type your password. There we go. So now that I'm logged in, I can run this command right here. So Docker push 
and then the actual tag. So let's go ahead and do that. So um, if I pretty much say Docker push, and then remember Amigos code forward slash website column one, press enter. You can see that now it's preparing and it's pushing. There we go. Let's do the same for the version two. And the images are not that big, to be honest, right? So remember, we are using Alpine and this is the benefit of Alpine. There we go. And now let's also push latest. And finished. Now, if I go ahead and go back to Docker Hub, now if I refresh, you can see that I do have the three images right here. So I've got version one of my website, version two, and the latest. So this is awesome. So you can see that now we have the images right inside of Docker Hub. And, you know, it's secure, you can share it with other people, and you can use it to run containers, so on and so forth. If you have issues getting this far, go ahead and drop me a message. Next, let me go ahead and show you how to search and pull your own images. All right, so we've pushed these three images right here for our awesome website. And inside of Docker Hub, what I'm going to do is to click on Docker Hub. So basically click right here. And what I'm going to do is simply search for your own username. So go ahead and actually search for mine for now. So simply say Amigos code. And then you should see this repository, right? So this is the website that we've just pushed in the previous video. So go ahead and click on it. And you can see that no overview is available. But if you are doing this for yourself, go ahead and add more information because it's always useful for someone that wants to use your images. So you can see that we have tags right here. So these are the three tags that we've pushed. And if I go back to overview, you can see that the command right here to pull the image is simply Docker pull amigos code and then forward slash website. So let's go ahead and try that out. So let me go ahead and open up terminal. And what I'm going to do is simply say Docker image ls. you can see that we have uh, amigos code website one here. So let me go ahead and simply say Docker I for image. And then let's go ahead and simply delete the amigos code website column one as well as two and then latest. There we go. Now if I do a Docker image LS, you can see that it's gone, right? So we have this Amigos dash website and this is from previous videos that we've done. Now what I'm going to do is simply say Docker pull and go ahead and also try this. So simply say Docker pull and then Amigos code forward slash website and then press enter. And actually before you press enter, so because we're not specifying the actual version, whether it's one or two, we will simply get the latest one. So press enter and you can see that it's using the default tag and done. Now, if I do a Docker image LS, you can see that we have Amigos code forward slash website and then latest right at the top. Now, let's go ahead and run a container from it. So run and what we want to run is the actual website. So right here, let me simply add a forward slash website. And I think that port has been used already. So let me go ahead and simply expose 9000. And then right here, 
this is forward slash and then amigos code and then press enter and we can't use forward slash forward name so let me actually remove that and simply say uh, website enter there we go now if I open up my web browser and then localhost and then 9000 and you can see that this is working and it should also work for you so there you go this is how you push images to a container registry we've used docker hub but the process for pushing to amazon ec2 container registry is the same and also if you are using key.io is the exact same process and one last thing remember that we had this api right here so what i want you to do is to experiment this process on your own so go ahead and push this that you have locally for this api to your own docker registry if you have any questions go ahead and drop a message and i'll be more than happy to assist in the meantime let's move on All right, in this video, let me go ahead and show you an important command that you might need to know in case you want to debug your Docker containers. So, so far, if I do a Docker PS and then format, you can see that I've got two containers running. And this is the actual API. And then this is the website version two. Now, this Docker PS command simply gives us some information about this container or actually these two running containers but sometimes you want to investigate fully the configuration for a container so the way you do it is simply by typing docker and then inspect so you want to inspect if i get this right so you want to inspect and then you can either pass the id or the actual name so id or name so let me go ahead and grab the id for our api paste that in if i press enter you can see that now this gives us a json format uh, information and right here we have a bunch of information about this running container so if i scroll up so right here you can see that you have the id this was the time that it was created these are the arguments that we've passed remember so node and then index.js you can see the state is running paused so basically you can see the full state for this running container you can see the image you can see some information about the log path the name the driver platform it's linux you can also see the actual host config. So right here, this is more about the networking part. So you can see that right here, you have a port binding, right? So right now you have 3000 being mapped to 3000 on the host, right? So we've learned all about this. And then you have stuff such as restart policies, uh, volume drivers. So if I scroll up, I just wanna show you, uh, you can see that we have the CPU period, uh, devices, memory swaps. Um, right here, you can see that we have some read-only paths. And then if I scroll down, you can see some information about the graph driver, uh, the mounts, the configuration right here. So we haven't got any, some environments. So this is, uh, this is the list of environment variables. So right here, so we have the path. This is the node version right here. So this is exposed by default and also the yarn version right here. So you can see that. And some networking settings again. And there we go. So basically, sometimes when you want to fully inspect your container, you pretty much run Docker and then inspect and then the container ID or name. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, let's learn how to view logs for a container. All right, sometimes you want to view exactly what is going on 
with your container. So logs. So logs is a very important concept that you need to know because sometimes you might want to monitor the traffic that goes to your container or any other logs that you have configured. So the way that logs work with Docker is very straightforward. So if I type Docker, uh, well actually let me just press up a couple of times. So Docker PS, you can see that we have this user service API. Now, the way that you can see logs about this container is if I grab that name and then type Docker, and let me clear the screen for now, simply type Docker and then logs, and then paste the actual container ID. If I press enter, you can see that this is the actual log that we saw way back when we configured Express.js. So you can see that this says example app listening on port 3000. So if I open up VS Code quickly, there we go. If I go to index.js, you can see that if I scroll down right here, so this is the actual log. So whenever you say console.log, you can see that we can capture that with Docker. So if I now go back to my terminal, and what I'm going to do is actually uh, do a docker ps again and let's actually grab the logs for our nginx uh, website so if i grab that and then say docker logs paste that in you can see that now right here we have a bunch of other logs so this is actually if you look carefully these are all the requests you can see that there is a get request right here another one here another one here and um, yeah, basically those. And if you scroll up, you can see a lot more, right? But what I'm going to do now is simply go back to Chrome and let me go to my website, refresh, and then go back to terminal. So I want you to see this. So now if I do a Docker uh, logs on the Nginx website, you can see that we are getting some requests. So this is really cool because now you can see exactly uh, all the logs. And if you want to, for example, ship these logs to a service such as Yumio or Elasticsearch, then you can do it, right? So what I'm going to do here is show you that you saw that I can type Docker logs every time to inspect the logs, but also there is this flag right here dash and then F. And this means to follow. So if I press enter, you can see that now, if I pretty much refresh this, so actually, let me put it uh, on the side like that. And this also now right here, if you watch the right hand side, if I pretty much just refresh, you can see that this also refreshes and you can see that we get a get request right here. So if I press and get started, obviously nothing happens because this is a single page website, but you get the idea, right? So if I refresh again, you can see that it's following the logs. So this is awesome. And if you want to learn more about logs, so let me just resize this and then put in the middle. If I cancel out of this, so control C type uh, Docker and then logs dash dash and then help. And this will give you all the commands that you can use with logs. So go ahead and experiment with logs, but this is very important when you want to debug your containers or everything that you log in your apps. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop me a message. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one. All right. So sometimes you want to get into a container and see exactly what is going on inside of the container, right? So you want to go inside the box and see exactly what is happening. So remember when we did type Docker and then PS and let's go ahead and grab the user service API. So let's go ahead and grab that enter. Uh, oh, actually not PS, but I want to inspect. So inspect. So right here. So remember that we saw that the actual box was Linux. So the platform was Linux right here. 
So sometimes you want to get into the box uh, and and pretty much just navigate your way around or you might have installed some software on the box and pretty much you just want to um, debug even further why certain things aren't working. So the way that you jump into a container is simply by typing docker or actually first, let me go ahead and describe all of these again so you can see. So the way that you jump into a box is simply by saying docker and then exec and then dash it. So let me actually go ahead and simply say dash dash help so you can see the exact commands. So right here, you can see that I stands for interactive. So keep the standard in open, even if not attached. And then dash T allocates a pseudo TTI. So let's go ahead and simply type the exact same command. So docker exec dash IT and then paste the actual uh, container ID. And in fact, I forgot. So let me format this again and then grab that container ID. And then let's say dash and then IT pass the container ID. And then right here, simply go ahead and say forward slash and then bin forward slash bash and then press enter. And this failed, but it failed because we don't have bash here. And what I want to show you first is actually if we uh, grab this ID again. So let's grab this ID Docker inspect. So this is how you use your debugging skills and then search for CMD. And there we go. So right here, you can see that the command that it was used to execute node was forward slash bin sh dash c and then node index.js. So let's go ahead and clear this. And now if I pretty much uh, say docker exec it, now you can see that I can simply say sh enter. And now I'm inside of the container. So if I type ls minus al, this is pretty much the working directory that we have set within our Docker file for this API. So if I type pwd, you can see that I'm inside of forward slash app. So if I do a cd and then dot dot, go back, same command again, ls dash al, enter. And now you can see that this is the actual Linux file structure. Assalamu alaikum. I'm super excited that you've made this far. So you saw the power of Docker and what you can do with it. So I'm a DevOps engineer and I use Docker every single day. And I can tell you that by knowing how to use Docker, you now can explore paths such as Kubernetes. So Kubernetes takes the advantage of uh, containers and then orchestrates those containers for you. So go ahead and check my website. I've got a full course waiting for you on Kubernetes. If you haven't joined the private Facebook group, go ahead and join and also Discord, we are waiting for you. Give me a thumbs up so I can keep on recording these videos. Subscribe to my channel and this is all for now. I'll catch you in the next one. Assalamu alaikum.